going to introduce two 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 techniques today uh, that are used to image to image tissue with light and sound. So they are called acoustic imaging and photoacoustic imaging. So I know they have names that are really like close to one another, but it's two very different techniques relying on two different physics. Um, but first, a bit of uh, of introduction is. Um, what is the issue with optical imaging issue? So I guess you you've been uh, you've probably come to understand now that like basically optical imaging in tissue is like trying to see or to look for a very dense fog. It's like you can't really if you imagine a, a day with a lot of fog, uh, you're on the road and you barely see the car like a few meters away and you can't really see anymore what's happening. Uh, but in tissue, it's like the it's the same thing, but uh, instead of having a, a Field of view of a few meters, you have barely a hundred micron to a millimeter. It's like after after a millimeter, the light is so scrambled that you don't see anything. Um, so light still goes through formation anymore. Um, and so there are some techniques to, uh, despite that, there are still some techniques that have been used to image uh, in tissue, in biological tissue. Uh, so, for example, the solution that exists mostly at the moment is things like diffuse optical tomography, which take advantage of just surrounding your, your, I'm going to, yeah. So just surrounding your material with, uh, with a lot of light sources and detector, and then by sending light at different paths and then reconstructing numerically, you can try to guess what's inside the scattering tissue. Um, so it is good because it can provide information at a few centimeter deep, it has a very limited resolution, like where you can't see features that are less than five millimeter to a centimeter. So it's very limited when, if you want to do early diagnosis of cancer, for example, uh, you can't catch really small tumors. So it's, it has a limited um, limited range of application. Uh, and other methods of imaging in tissue that are really commonly used and that were probably some of the first methods to be used is all the microscopy techniques uh, and now more like advanced microscopy, like quantum microscopy, confocal microscopy, or even optical current tomography. Um, these ones are very good resolution, like in the micrometer range, but it's very due to scale, since they ex these techniques exploit only um, the, the ballistic light, the light that travels straight, uh, they only have very shallow depth, so after, after a few micron to a millimeter. Uh, you can't really image anymore. Um, so there has been a development of hybrid approach uh, that mix light with ultrasound. So I'm going to talk about two of them today. Uh, so photoacoustic imaging, which is based on the ultrasound generation of the, the generation of ultrasound waves by light, and the acoustic imaging, which is the modulation of light by an acoustic field. Um, and basically those techniques, uh, they rely on one principle, one big idea is that ultrasound, uh, they are not scattered when travel, when they are traveling in tissue. Uh, ultrasound only goes, goes like light, uh, travels in tissue the same way that light travel in vacuum or, or uh, air is just in straight line. Um, so it means that you can get information, local information from ultrasound. So if you manage to combine the two of them, you can try to hope having the optical information and having this with a good resolution. So the resolution given by ultrasound, which is usually around, can be between 100 micron to a millimeter. So it's better than a few millimeter to a centimeter of DOT. And you can have that with a good penetration depth, so a few centimeters deep. So I'm going to start with... Uh, I'm going to start with photoacoustic imaging. Um, so it's the, the, the idea is to, to generate ultrasound wave with light. So um, how does that work? So it's the acoustic imaging is a, it's based on the, the, the photoacoustic effect, which has been discovered by uh, Alexander Graham Bell in late, late 1900s or early 1900s. I don't remember exactly. Um, and he noticed that when you, send a really short light pulse, uh, like a brief illumination on a piece of matter, uh, the, that piece of material will absorb light. And as a result, the first, uh, the, the part that absorbs the light is going to heat up 
and there's going to want to contract, so there's going to be to, to expand, so there's going to be a thermoelastic effect. And this thermoelastic effect will result in an acoustic pressure wave that is just going to be emitted in the tissue. Um, so it means that if you can detect that wave, you can try to get some information, recover some information about the the for the the object that actually absorbed the light. Um, so how does it usually done is you have your piece of tissue with your absorber that emits your ultrasound wave, and then you have a coupling medium and you place an ultrasound probe, and then you detect depending on the the channel on your probe, you detect different pulse at different time, and then using techniques called the beamforming algorithm, which basically try to do some time of flight. If you know the speed of sound, you know how long, how much how long it to, took to travel, and you can reconstruct where the uh, the um, where the absorber was. And using that is been technique that that technique has been developed widely in the next in the past twenty years, and now there are some incredible images um, that have been done like so for example here you can see the, the vascularization on the hand uh, of a patient uh, and that color they, they color coded the different depths or the different uh, sometimes also depending on the illumination um, you can you can do that at different wavelengths uh, and then get some information about chromophore concentration locally uh, especially it's very efficient at detecting blood vessels as you can see on those kind of pictures so I'm just going to go through a few uh, a few application of uh, photoacoustic imaging. Um, so, for example, it can be used for breast imaging uh, because since it has a good sensitivity to hemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin, because you can eliminate a different uh, wavelengths, you can you can do laser uh, lasers at different wavelengths, um, and also the breast is actually a good target because it's not too big. Uh, it's not too deep, like mostly you never need to go past a few centimeters. So uh, the penetration depth is good enough to image most breasts. And so you can try to detect targets. So, so like for example, here there's an image of again vascular uh, vasculature in, uh, in a human breast. Uh, other application, for example, is for dermatology imaging or vascular or imaging the vascular uh, vasculature in extremities and quantifying. Uh, hemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin. So, for example, here you have an uh, image of the, the skin. Uh, so, you see here the, the, how the, 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 the different layers of the skin. So, you have the epidermis, the dermis, and then the, how, how the, the main vascularity for so the, the big blood vessels and the, the tiny capillaries are organized in, in your skin. And you have a, a photoacoustic image uh, on the left. That shows the big blood vessel uh, and in the different layers of the of tissue. And another application, for example, is for musculoskeletal imaging. So you can try to look in soft joints and soft tissue. Uh, so you have to. When I guess one of the the, the this, one of the things that photoacoustic can't do is image through hard tissue like bones. Uh, or through uh, tissue filled with air, like the lungs, uh, because ultrasound do not propagate really well in those tissue. So, for example, here it's in a joint, so in between two bones, um, and they looked, they tried to, so they, in grayscale, you have the not classic ultrasound image of the joint, so you see the two pieces of bone here, um, and then in, uh, in color scale, they try to quantify the oxygen saturation uh in the in in this joint so for the normal patient it's green and for they noticed that uh the oxygen saturation was higher and uh, for the sorry for the, the 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 patient with inflammatory arthritis it's green so low saturation uh whereas for a volunteer a uh, healthy volunteer it's red uh so it means that the the oxygen saturation is higher and like at the normal level compared to uh to uh uh, to a patient with uh, with inflammatory arthritis. Um, so that's just it for like a, a small overview of photoacoustic imaging. I'm going faster on on that uh, that technique because that's not a technique I'm working with. Um, I'm working mostly with uh, um, the other one that I'm going to present now, the acoustic optic imaging. 
uh, what I thought he was, was mentioning because photoacoustic imaging is actually much more developed and is starting to get into clinical application uh, and being more and more widely accepted, uh, like approved by different medical agencies in the, all around the world. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's also one way of mixing light and sound. So now I'm going to talk about the other method that uh, I'm working with uh, in Tyndall. Um, it's called acoustic imaging. Um, so acoustic imaging, uh, again, it's used for bio biomedical, it can be used for biomedical Im uh, imaging, um, and it's based on the acoustic effect, which is now, uh, instead of being, having a pulse of light that generates ultrasound, now what we have is we have both already at the same time. We have we send light and with a ultrasound, and we look at what's happening to uh, the light when the, the the photons are traveling in the acoustic uh, acoustic field. So in the normal acoustic optic effect, you have a pulse of light that goes through uh, a clear medium in which you have an acoustic absorber. So it can be so for acoustic optic modulators, this little device you have in the lab it could be quartz and acoustic absorber, and uh, uh, just a standard. Uh, piezoelectric transistor, but you can use it in water with normal ultrasound waves. And what's happening in that case is the, the light gets modulated and gets diffracted into different directions depending on the how much they get modulated. So they get modulated by the ultrasound frequency. So you have the, the main beam that stays the same, and then you have a diffracted beam at a certain angle that depends on the ultrasound frequency uh, that goes, and then a, a beam that gets diffracted have it be even bigger angle and that's modulated at twice the ultrasound frequency. Um, so how we can use that in scattering medium like biological tissue. So if you start to send the laser beam in your tissue, it scatters and the light goes everywhere. And if you look at the optical spectrum of the exiting light, you have your initial spectrum. But then now if you start sending your ultrasound wave, you'll have photons that are going to get modulated and they are going to travel also a bit everywhere. Um, and so it means that now at the exit of your set, uh, system, you have two, ta two types of photons. You have the what we call the untagged photon, which are the photons at the normal frequency. And then you have the tagged photons, which are the photons that have been frequency shifted by the ultrasound. Um, so we usually only consider the photons that have been frequency shifted once because they, uh, the, the, the efficiency of the, the shifting decrease. Uh, decrease uh, a lot with the, the with, with the order, so only consider plus or minus for now. That's usual. Uh, but it means that if you manage to detect those photons, the one that are the tag photons, then you can get some information about the the location where the ultrasound uh, field was. And so, since ultrasound propagates uh, ballistically in tissue, you can easily focus them somewhere. So then you can make your imaging by just focusing the ultrasound at the specific point, measuring the tag photons, and then scanning uh, that focus uh, in the tissue, and you can image point by point your piece of tissue. Um, but there is quite a lot of challenges. So one of the main challenges is the very small frequency shift. So if you take a few orders of magnitude in head, and if you take near infrared light at one micron, uh, wavelengths and the, it means that the the frequency the optical frequency corresponds to around three uh, times ten to the fourteen hertz. Uh, ultrasound, on the other hand, are usually in the megahertz range. So let's imagine, let's consider five megahertz. In that case, it means the the wavelength shift is ten to the minus five nanometers. So it means that you need to filter a component that is at one micron and one point zero 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 zero. One micro, and uh, yeah, and one point zero 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 one micron. So it's really very close and single, like normal filtering uh, filters that you can find in laboratories are not usually that uh, that fine. Another change is a very small number of tag photons. So usually it's around one thousand to uh, one millionth of the and the original light intensity. So you have a very bad signal to noise ratio initially. Um, and then a third difficulty is the fact that uh, the, due to the multiple scattering, you end up having a special pattern on the 
uh, on the output. So it means that you can't do a simple detection of looking at the intensity of your speckle pattern because all the speckle grains do not oscillate in phase. So even if you increase your detector size, you're not going to increase your signal. And then the, the final challenge is that speckle decorates in a millisecond time scale in tissue uh, because of natural movement in tissue like uh, like breathing, heartbeat, um, and blood flow. So all of these will make the speckle move at a certain frequent uh, and certain bend that gives also a parasitic signal. So how can we detect um, acoustic signals? So I'm going to present mainly two two detection methods. Uh, one uh, is called a based on holography and another one based on filtering. Um, so the idea here is you have your light source, you have your, your medium, and then you send ultrasound. And basically you want to be able to detect the, phot the, the tag photons depending on where your ultrasound is. So you need to have a, your tag photon detector uh, that is able to, to separate the tag photon from the untag photon to be able to make your image. Um, so the first uh, method is to use holography. So the idea is to use interference with a reference wave to separate the tag photons from the untag photons. So since the reference is, so you you have sorry, you have, so first you have your your do your two field your your electric field of the tag photons and your electric field of the untag photons, uh, and you send your reference uh, that is pre frequency shifted. You can do with an acoustic modulator, for example. Uh, at the same frequency of the tag, because you know which frequency you put. Uh, and then you have your, your figure of interference. So we have all those terms. And ideally, what you want is you want to measure the intensity of the tag photon. So you want that term. Uh, that's, what you, that's what you would like. The problem is if you look at your interference pattern uh, that you have, so you record your interference pattern. Let's say you record in a camera, if you try to look at at your interference pattern, the intensity of the tag photon you won't be able to uh, to isolate because there is also the intensity of the untag beam and the intensity of the reference, and all those three are mixed together and they can't be separated. So your other choice is to try to go for that term um, because that term, the since the the tag photons electric field oscillate at the same frequency as the ultrasound, and the reference is also oscillating at the same frequency when they interfere with each other, that oscillation cancel, uh, which is not the case for the two other terms. Uh, the two other terms you see are color coded, so they have different frequencies, so which means that those are still oscillating at the, the, the frequency of the ultrasound. So they are, if you have a detection system that, going, that is slow enough, they're going to average out and you won't you won't get any information from them. So that one is the one you want to, to target. And you can also separate it by from the the, um, the three other terms. So there's sorry, I'm going to shift back. So they there's it's separated in time due to the, the time oscillation. Um, but now is how can you separate it in from those three other terms here? And if you introduce an angle between the two beams, like I draw here, you create a fringe pattern that is going to um, to superimpose on the speckle uh, the, the speckle pattern. And so it means that with that fringe pattern, special fringe pattern, you also can separate that term in time uh, by with that special modulation. So then. So there is a there is multiple way of detecting the of doing that this type of uh, of holography is so you can do that by digital holography uh, so that's the, the technique we're using at the moment in uh, in the lab in uh, in our lab in Tyndall is the interference pattern is recorded using a camera and then we process everything digitally so we just try to isolate those from using Fourier transform uh, because that's basically we try to get signal that is at a specific carrier frequency. Um, but then there is other more like analog uh, technique. So one is based on two-wave mixing. 
which you basically send your interference pattern into a photosensitive crystal and then you can read back by diffraction uh, of the reference grating on that interference pattern. I'm not going to go into the details, but um, usually photosensitive crystals are crystals that uh, have a, one of their properties, so like refractive index or uh, absorption that depends on the illumination. So I can answer a question on that if you want later. And then there is another uh, another actually method is by what's called four wave mixing holography, uh, and in that case you need two reference beams. Um, and what's happening is you record the, the hologram, so you record a ref, a, ga a grating inside a photosensitive medium, and now you use a second reference that is counter propagating to the first one, and when it diffracts, it creates what's called a phase conjugate beam um, that has the property of traveling back on the path it took and it will refocus on the target. So it will refocus where the tag photons were creating and that's technique called true focusing. I'm just going to slightly mention it uh, a bit later when I, I go through different uh, application of acoustic imaging. Um, but now I'm just going to talk quickly about uh, another method of detection. It's a simple filtering. So the idea is, okay, can we try to create a a filter that has an absorption, a very narrow absorption uh, to be able to isolate the photons. So a simple, uh, a simple, for, uh, um, simple filter that you can buy uh, you know, on like optics shop, uh, optics suppliers, they don't do that. So you need to go with more advanced technique. And one of them is called spectral hole burn. So the idea is to have all your, the intensity of your, your, both your, your light, the tagged light and the in, uh, untagged light goes through a rare earth crystal. So it's a crystal dot with rare earth ion. And to have this very narrow absorption, so the untagged light is going to be very absorbed while the tag light is practically going to go through. So how do you do that? Um, so if you have a rare earth crystal, it has a wide absorption band, but that wide absorption band is actually a collection of very narrow absorption bands uh, from different ions, dep depending on where they are in the crystal. And what you can do is you can try to saturate that absorption by sending a very intense light uh, at a very specific frequency. Uh, and what it's going to do is going to create, if you saturate all the absorbers, then it's going to create a hole in the absorption band and you'll have your transparency window uh, for that's going to last for a couple of, it can last to a couple of hundred milliseconds, microsecond to a millisecond. Some experiment managed also to make that hole last for a few seconds, which is more than enough to send a couple of ultrasound bursts and try to image through the medium. Uh, and there's also a bonus effect actually when you do that is since you have your absorption that is very narrow uh, and very, yeah, the, your, your absorption is very narrow. It means that the, the very sharp uh, change in absorption also creates a very high refractive index at the, the, the frequency of the light. And the, the idea is that in that case, the, the tag light is going to also travel slower in the crystal. And the, the slow, so it's called a slow light filter. And, by, and it's slowing down significantly to be delayed by a few microseconds, which can be picked up by an electronic. So it means that basically when you send your post light that exit the medium at the same, the, they exit your scattering medium at the same time, then they go through your crystal and then the tag light is delayed compared to the untagged light. So you have like a, a better contrast that way. Um, so I'm going to speed up a little bit for time. Um, so the, Quick advantage of geographic detection is just it's simpler and short not limited, and you have a possibility to use to amplify the beam using your reference. Uh, the problem is it's very sensitive to decoration and movement in general, and it has a low acceptance angle, so you're only limited by the, uh, the your camera or your crystal acceptance angle. Whereas detection with uh, with spectral hole burning as a high contrast. It's very, it's one of these main advantages being insensitive to decoration and movement. Uh, but the problem is require uh, cryogenic, cryogenic cooling. So cooling your crystal at four Kelvin uh, or less. Uh, so it's much more expensive to put in place.
And so now I'm going to go quickly overview of what has been done using acoustic optic imaging. So for example, here is an experiment that's been done where they had a piece of liver tissue with, um, with metastasis of, uh, of melanoma, so really black uh, tissue, really black spot embedded into a scattering gel and they try to do acoustic optic imaging to see can, you, can they see the absorption for instance, the two dips in the signal due to the two spots here. Um, one of the advantages, so that uh, was a, a first experiment in ex vivo. Then another experiment is you can actually, instead of trying to look for absorbing inclusion, you can sort of look what happened to more scattering inclusion. So here is um, lesion caused by high fuel, high fuel. So high fuel is high intensity focus ultrasound. So when you focus ultrasound for a while, you can burn locally tissue inside. Uh, so that's what they did here. They, they basically burned the tissue and then they did an imaging to see, can we see that contrast? And so again, they can could see both uh, contrast uh, due to different scattering properties. Um, and here is like an imaging of uh, optical and mechanical inclusion. So they have three inclusion in tissue uh, that have the same scattering property, but different, either different mechanical property or different optical property or a mix of both. And so they try to detect those different inclusions. So they did first an elasticity measurement. So that's the green. And then the blue is the acoustic optic signal. And so you can see the difference in the signal. Uh, you can see that with the with acoustic optic, you can see all the three inclusions, whereas with uh, the elasticity, you can only see the one that have an elastic contrast and not the one that have uh, optical inclusion. So it's kind of complementary, you know, where you can try to say, oh, uh, the different properties can guess the property of your inclusions depending on the, the different signal of the different method. And another, another application that is quite looked at also using ultrasound is how to focus light inside tissue. So there's basically two two methods that um, one of them is called true focusing. So the one I mentioned earlier is if you manage to record the wavefront of, uh, of, the, um, of the tag photons on a, a camera, then you can use a special device called a special light modulator that can recreate wavefront. And you can basically recreate the wavefront that would focus in the issue at a specific location given by the ultrasound. And if at that location there is a light emitter like a fluorescent dye, uh, you could you can excite very efficiently that fluorescent dye. And for example, as Kasia just talked about upconverting nanoparticles, we could try to imagine doing that also with upconverting nanoparticles to uh, excite more efficiently uh, upconverting nanoparticles. And another approach um, is to use uh, acoustic transmission matrix where you record. Uh, so it's a really mixed approach where you record a lot of wavefront uh, that will enable you to recreate uh, the light that propagates at a, that, that repropagates at a, uh, at a location of the, at a specific location uh, given by the ultrasound. And the, then the advantage of that method is you can digitally process uh, your big matrix to try to create waveforms that are much more optimized. And they show that using the normal true focusing that you would have the focus given in the B, uh, B figure where it's a large focus on a single on a few speckle grains. Whereas when you use that transmission matrix that they created, um, you can focus in much uh, tighter spot um, on given by one speckle grain, as you can see here, the image C. And then you can, you have like the intermediate, different intermediate state to focus basically on like different, uh, different shapes that you want. And so, yeah, that's it for the, an overview of uh, ultrasound, mixing of ultrasound and light. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you.